Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at another Ryzen DDR5 overclock, this time on an MSI motherboard, because I finally have one. So then, let's get into the system specs. Uh, the CPU is a Ryzen 9 7950X that I purchased. The, M the motherboard is an MSI B650i Edge Wi-Fi that I also purchased, so big thank you to the channel supporters for making those purchases possible. And the memory kit is a Kingbank Sharp Blade DDR5 2x32 gig kit, uh, which was provided by Kingbank, so big thank you to them for sending that over. Uh, the XMP on X, well, it actually comes with both an XMP and an Expo profile, and that profile is 6400CL32. Um, I really wish there was also like a 6000CL30 Expo profile on there, because 6400 on a lot of Ryzen CPUs is not going to work in one-to-one -one mode, which will force you to run 6400 in two to well, like which basically means most motherboards will default 6400 into two to one mode, and two to one mode at 6400 is really not great in terms of performance. So, uh, as like it's not like a 6400 rated kit is not like beginner friendly for for Ryzen CPUs because you basically like it's very likely that you're gonna have to manually like turn the kit down. Though technically you could just drop it to 6000 and like not change the timings and that wouldn't affect things too much. But uh anyway, the memory chips on this memory kit are 16 gigabit Hynix 8i, so since these are 32 gig dims, uh this is a dual rank uh memory configuration, right? Cuz you've got two ranks of memory on each stick and so there's two ranks of memory on each memory channel. So, that's the system specs, um, now let's take a look at the stress tests and then take a look at the settings. So, <clears throat> um, as you can see, it's been running Carhu for the last two days. That might be because I've been um, procrastinating recording this video rather than, like, me setting a target of two days. Like, the goal was, like, I wanted to stress test, like, 16 hours or something, and then, then... Yeah, that kind of got out of hand. But anyway, so yeah, it's been running uh, Carhu for the last two days. Um, the temperatures right now are like 41 degrees, 44 degrees. Um, and so these are not running really that hot right now, because uh, like the last time I, well, I did one, I've already used these sticks in a different video. In that video, I was really pushing them as like, well, I was pushing them pretty hard going for like 6200 CL26. This time around, I decided that um, well, the high voltage mode on this motherboard does work. I haven't, like, gone through an extensive set of memory kits yet to see if it works on everything, but so far I haven't run into a memory kit where uh, high voltage mode doesn't work. But I figured, uh, since the last time I ran these sticks, I was running them at, like, silly high voltages that I would potentially be willing to daily, but really, like, it made them run hot and, you know... Really, the only benefit was that you could run C CL26 instead of, like, CL30, so... Not really, like, from a, not really, a, like, a sensible configuration. Um, so I figured this time around, you know, uh, I'd run them at more more sensible voltages. Um, just to do, try something different with the kit. Because, I don't know, running, every, like, r doing 6200 CL26 at 1.65 volts kind of gets old once you do it, like, the fourth time. Um... Yeah, that, that's the best way to put it. So I figured I'd, I'd try some more sensible voltages. So 1.43 on the VDD and... Well, VDDQ is actually 1.35. 1, 1 um, that's not like a... Like, I mean, it might slightly help the memory stick temperatures, but that's not like... Uh... uh like, it, it, it would have worked fine at 1.4 probably. Um, there. I guess what I, this isn't like a, a lot of gigabyte motherboards where they need like really weirdly low VDDQ. Um, as far as I can tell, that like MSI boards don't do that. Uh, and I didn't test if like 1.25 VDDQ would work well. Um, but yeah, like and the thing is, like in one to one mode, this board evidently seems to have a pre it might have a pretty wide range of like functioning voltages. I haven't tested that, so yeah, but. I tried 1.35 and it was like passing all the stress tests, so it's like, cool, uh, I'll take that. Um, there's no reason to, to... I don't see any point in going further. So yeah, with the fan on the memory sticks, they are running really quite cool. Uh, and that's even with the room temperature being like 20 degrees Celsius. Though it is an open air, air test bench, and yeah, there's a fan sitting directly on top of the memory sticks. Um, so yeah, that's why the temperatures are so very low on them. 
Um, now then, uh, we don't have any errors over here, as you can see. Um, and yeah, Carhu's been running for two days, which, like I mentioned, wasn't really intentional. That's just procrastination things. Uh, there's no errors. I also ran uh, 12,000 uh, seconds of Y Cruncher. Um, right, so you can see 12,000 seconds. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, like three and a half hours, basically. Um, and yeah. And so all of the stress tests passed. Um, so I guess at this point, um, I'll just commit to the take and we'll go take a look at the BIOS on this board. Um, and like the settings that I'm running in the BIOS. So the board does have troubleshooting LEDs, which I, I do appreciate for an ITX board, because a lot of ITX boards, you don't get that kind of... Well, you get don't get anything a lot of the time, right? You just, you get nothing, because ITX board. Um, too small to have troubleshooting LEDs. Um, so... Oh, I should have closed Carhu. It won't let... I don't think it'll let it restart. The LEDs to be visible. Um, though I guess if you actually put the board in a system, you won't be able to see them anyway, because they're, like, going to be buried inside the case. Um, also what I've noticed is the LEDs on this board don't tend to do much. It usually just lights up the DRAM LED and then it, like, boots. Um, it's taking a surprisingly long, considering I'm pretty sure memory context restore is still enabled. I'm using a bit of an older BIOS because, uh, like, initially I w wanted to, like, test out 2-to-1 mode on this board because it's an ITX one dim per channel, right? Um, and I started with the APU, bi like, the BIOSes that actually support the APUs, and the board was not doing a very good job in 2-to-1 mode, so I downgraded to a, like, pre-APU BIOS because that's something I ran into with a another board where it was, like, it actually, for 2-to-1 mode with the Ryzen... CPUs, it was a lot more stable with an older BIOS rather than the latest one. So we're on the 1007 AGSA right now. Um, I think it's 1007C. Also, this is taking really long to post. I wonder if the newer BIOSes would also do this. So the thing is, with the newer BIOSes, there is some, like very clear changes in, in how the memory training works. Like, the newer BIOSes often use very different terminations from the older BIOSes. Um, on some boards, they really don't clock very well. Um, on other boards, they actually clock better. So that's been kind of interesting, is just like, yeah, the, the AP, like, and that's not necessarily even with an APU, that's like with, with just CPUs. Okay, now it... Now I'm getting suspicious. Why is it taking so long? Anyway, so 2 to 1 mode on this board, as far as I'm concerned, kind of sucks. And right up until this point, I was pretty happy with the 1 to 1 mode behavior. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh. I guess it just derped out. So the thing is, I have seen 
an issue with some Ryzen motherboards occasionally where they won't re like when you have like well they'll just randomly mistrain. Well, this is on auto, so I guess it might be dis no, it, no, it has to be enabled because it would have taken way. Wait, maybe it got stuck on the restart. Cause that that. Anyway, so that's super weird. Um, so yeah, the thing is now I kind of feel like I would like, yeah, kind of feel like I should probably run another stress test. Cause the thing is I have seen Ryzen motherboards, like they'll re sometimes I'll reboot and the memory stability is just gone, like completely gone. And at that point, what you need to basically do is reset the BIOS and like force a retrain. Well, actually you don't necessarily need to reset the BIOS, but you do need to somehow force a memory retrain. I'm probably resetting the BIOS and then like re resetting up the overclock by loading a profile is, is usually the best option. Um, I've also seen it happen at JDEC that like a Ryzen motherboard will just like m m like m completely misinitialize the memory. Like I'm not even sure it's like mistraining because with memory context restore, it shouldn't be doing any training. Um, but yeah, so that is super weird somewhat concerning so after after seeing this i would definitely want to run a stress test on it um but i'm just going to assume that the stress test is going to pass because i'm not really sure like if that was actually like the board still well yeah that's the thing i i can't you, you can't tell until you try to run a stress test if, if it actually like messed up the memory configuration or if it was just like some kind of restart bug because restarts and power down and power on are not the same thing right um slightly different anyway let's go through the bio settings so uh soc voltage at 1.265 this is a little might be a little bit high for 6200 but i did try 1.23 and that did not work at all so um yeah, so this isn't necessarily minimized, but for 6200 with this CPU on this board, um, less than, like, 1.23 won't work. Um, so, yeah, other than that, I also have the LLC set to mode 2. Uh, I'm just working on the assumption that the SoC power rail doesn't really have to work that hard, because um, it usually doesn't for the CPUs. For APUs, it's different, but with the CPUs, you can run, like, very aggressive LLCs on the uh, the... SOC, and it, it's not going to cause any, any, like, voltage regulation issues in my experience. I haven't measured that on this board yet, but I would be very surprised if, if it worked any differently from any other board in that sense. Anyway, so memory voltage, we're on 1.43 volts VDD, 1.35 VDDQ, and 1.4 volts VDDIO. So MSI, th like, this board seems to be a lot like, say, ASRock or ASUS, where the boards kind of prefer pretty high VDDQ and VDDIO compared to, say, gigabyte boards, which I think with this memory kit, when I had it on a gigabyte board, I was using 1.25 for both VDDIO and, I mean, VDDQ and VDDIO. Um... And yeah, here I'm using like 1.35, 1.4. Um, so that's interesting. Though it's, well, inter it's not new. It's just like, so MSI, like basically MSI, ASRock, and ASUS all run like very different signaling voltages from the gigabyte boards, which is, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, that's not really like compared to an ASRock or an ASUS board, this really isn't anything that weird. Um, so yeah, V. Oh, apparently MSI bumps the VPP voltage on auto, because by spec it's supposed to be 1.8 volts, so they're bumping it to 1.95. I'm pretty sure that, like, it's not going to hurt anything. It's also, I don't think it helps anything either. But, eh, I don't, I don't really see any reason to worry about that, because, like, I, like it, this isn't going to hurt anything. And it's also, like, I don't think it helps, but it, do, it doesn't hurt, so who cared? Like, it's not going to significantly increase the, like, operating temperature of the memory sticks or anything, so I really don't see any reason to worry about that. That's just kind of like, oh, interesting, MSI bumps the VPP voltage. Um, might be worth testing to see if that actually achieves anything. I kind of doubt it, because historically it really didn't do anything on any memory kits I tried. Uh, VDDP at 1.1 volts, uh, this was set by me. Um, and then VDDG, I have both at 0.9, um, cause we're just running 2066 on the infinity fabric so that we're in that three to two ratio for 6,200 on the memory. 
um, UCLK is equal to MCLK, right? So the memory controller is synchronized with the memory and the Infinity Fabric is ru running uh, two thirds of the memory controller frequency, uh, which like has a slight latency benefit. Um, so, you know, some kind of optimization in the buffers between the uh, Infinity Fabric and the memory controller. Though, uh, if you have a really like good CPU that can run 6200 at low SOC voltage, you might be able to run like 2200 FCLK at 6200, and that's just going to be better in terms of performance. Um, but this CPU with 1.265, it's probably not going to do uh, 2200 FCLK, and so 2066 is the better option in this case. Um, anyway, so timings, TCL at 30, TRCD at 37. Um, th like this is, I did test uh, CL28. Uh, it doesn't work. It would require more voltage than 1.43 volts. It might require, I guess it would probably need like 1.5, maybe more than, maybe slightly more than that. Um, and so, yeah, so, and then like CL26 requires like 1.65 volts. So, yeah, but if you're on like, if, without, you know, using the high voltage mode, which we can see uh, on off there, um, CL30 at 6200 is kind of the limit for these memory sticks. TRCD at 37, uh, this might go, uh, this also might go lower with like significantly higher voltage. TRCD scales ever so slightly with memory, like with VDD on Hynix 16 gigabit ADI. So there's like a chance it'll do, like, I think it might do 36 if I had the VDD at like 1.65. Um, it might even do 36 right now, though I didn't check. So, um, yeah, anyway, TRP, interestingly enough, I got it to go below 39 this time. Um, because of the last video I did that with these memory sticks, uh, I was really not able to set the TRP below 39. And this time around, I managed to get it to 35. Uh, required raising the TRAS, and I'm kind of wondering, like, I'm, I think there might, like, I think there's still headroom in the TRP timing, because um, that TRC is kind of loose uh, for a Hynix 8i kit. Um, so that's something I definitely want to do some more testing on. And also one really interesting thing I noticed uh, when test, like, setting up this kit on this motherboard is that the TRP TRAS, like, uh, well, like, actually, it's not really a... I the TRP TRAS TRC behavior didn't really show up until I tightened the tertiary uh, timings for dual rank, which was really interesting. So like with 11 and 11, you could actually run like, and I, I'm not, I think it was still erroring out. Actually, it might not have been. Because um, it's Y Cruncher that catches this usually. Um, the, like, setting in TRP too low. But, yeah, so, I think I was able to stress test, like, 3530, but with, like, when, when I had the dual rank timings really loose. And then I tightened, oh, no, I was testing 3630. Yeah, that's what I was testing. I was testing 3630. Um, and that passed, but I had the dual rank timings really loose. And so, because I was doing iterations of just, like, set some timings, run Y Cruncher, go back into the BIOS, and just going back and forth with Y Cruncher, not not using Carhu yet. Um, and yeah, I, like, I could run really low TRP and TRAS right up until I tighten the, the tertiary timings for dual rank, which is interesting. Um, so, chances are that this might work. Uh, okay, maybe not that. That might be a tad low, but something like this might work. Um, and honestly, I wouldn't even be necessarily too surprised if, say... Uh, okay, maybe... I'm not sure... Like, the thing is, I'm not sure if... Because uh, on single rank, you can set TRAS to 30, and it just, like, doesn't have any negative consequences. Um, but on dual rank, it actually causes, like, y cruncher to error out. So I'm kind of wondering if it's, like, a side effect of, like, dual rank, the pre, like, the pre-charge commands are getting sent a lot more frequently on dual rank, or a lot more quickly, something like that. Because um, TRAS controls the minimum delay between a activate and a uh, pre-charge command. Um, and so, like... Either, and it might even be a TRC thing. I, like, the thing is, I haven't, like, investigated this um, too much yet. 
Because, yeah, I, I've noticed this behavior, so it's like, oh, wait. <laughs> but I haven't, like, you know... Because the thing with memory, like, testing anything with memory is, like, you know, like, it takes hours to check if something actually does anything, right? At, at a bare minimum, because you can't run a five-minute test. Because things that, like, you can run, like, a five-minute test, and, it, like, if you're just running, like, you don't care about stability, you can push the timings, like, ludicrously low, right, for certain benchmarks. But if you actually care about stability, like, you need to run stress tests, long stress tests like minimum an hour if you're going to be like iterating on settings because things that will pass for like you know things that look good for like 10 minutes might not be good in 10 hours um and um, okay 10 hours might be kind of pushing it but it might not be good in like an hour or two um and actually with this when i was uh trying to run the tras too low like y cruncher was erroring out in like 16 was it 16 minutes something like that it was it wasn't instant right um, so this is the kind of thing where it's like, if you, like, this is the first time I've actually seen the TRAS affect stability, um, like this, um, and so, yeah, I haven't gotten around to, like, testing, uh, how much this behave, like, how, like, how far does this behavior go, um, and what exactly is going on with that, but, this combination right here works. I think the TRC could go lower. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, I I guess with like dual rank, the memory controller is like opening and closing rows a lot more frequently and like in short, like with shorter delays. And that's what suddenly causes like TRAS and TRP to have like a much stricter limit than single rank where like I've been able to run like T TRP at like 30 with a TRAS at 30 and it was fine. So, um... Yeah, very interesting, um, and probably going to do some more testing on that, though I'm kind of bored of messing with RAM, and also TRP and TRAS are like two timings that like, yeah, they have a measurable impact on performance if you use some of the most sensitive memory benchmarks out there. So they're not exactly what I would consider very important from a performance perspective. Anyway, let's move on to timings that uh, are a lot less annoying, because honestly, like, yeah, like, th these three right here, well, okay, TRP makes sense, but, well, TRC and TRAS are like, I'm not sure why we have both of them, <laughs> but anyway, um, so, uh, TWR is at the register limit, um, and MSI does actually follow the register limits, unlike some other motherboard vendors that'll let you punch in just impossibly low numbers for a lot of these timings. Uh, TRFC is at 488. This is actually kind of loose for, for Hynix 8i, but I really, like, the refresh interval's at 65,000. It just doesn't, like, 400 TRFC, 500 TRFC, when your refresh interval is 65,000 clock cycles, 500 clock cycles spent refreshing, or 400 clock cycles spent refreshing, are kind of the same thing. Um, so yeah, not concerned about those. Uh, then TRFC2 and TRFC same bank are set to 69, because that's nice. Also because those two timings aren't used by the in AMD memory controller, so they don't do anything. You can just punch, you can literally punch in whatever number you like he, in, into these. Um, I, well, actually, not literally, because they do max out at like 2048, I think. Um, well, the minimum is 50, and the maximum... Oh... Maximum is 4,095, yeah, so not literally arbitrary numbers, but, um, yeah, um, almost arbitrary numbers. Anyway, so for RTP, we're at 12, um, standard RTP timing for Hynix 8i, actually my 16 gigabit 8i at 6200, actually a bit loose potentially, like you might be able to push this a bit lower if you want to, um, TRDL at 8, TRDS at 4. Some kits can do 4-4. Four, four. Um, I don't really... Like, it doesn't make a huge performance difference, so I'm not in any, like, rush to, to go for that on every kit. On every kit, so I just go with 8-4. Um, and then T-420, because that doesn't go any... Oh, wait, no, MSI does let you go below 20, which... As far as I know, it's not actually supported by the CPU. So that's interesting, because they do have the TWR limit that I would expect. And then TFAW is just like, punch in whatever you like. Okay, cool. Like, TFAW 8 is literally impossible. Th this this doesn't make any sense. So, um, yeah. 
Um, anyway, WTRL uh, 14 and uh, WTRS 4. This might be a little bit loose. This is actually as tight as I've ever run WTRL for 6200. Um, and then for the turnaround timings, we have read to read SCL at 4. Uh, so, like, these two are our single rank timings, so just 4-1. Um, pretty sure 3 doesn't work at 6200 for that. And then the dual rank timings at 6-6, six, six, uh, 5 doesn't work at this speed. And I think maybe at, like, 5600 you might be able to run 5-5, five, five, but it's going to be slower overall, right? Because the memory speed's so much lower. And then uh, right to right SEL, we have four. This could have gone lower, but the right to right doesn't really affect performance that much. So, I, yeah, um, doesn't really matter. And then same dim, different dim at eight. And it's worth, like, like with the dual rank setups, I set both the same dim and different dim timings to the same thing because it it's just easier to keep track of. Like, technically... Uh, in this memory configuration, there isn't a different dim on each channel, right? Each channel has just one dim uh, dim slot on this board because it's an ITX. So there's only one memory stick. And so the different dim timing actually shouldn't apply to this memory configuration, and we could just leave it on whatever. Um, but on some memory controllers, the SD and DD timings are swapped around, and so... It's just more convenient to set both of them to the same thing. Because also, if you were running a quad rank setup, I'm pretty sure you would be setting them to the same thing anyway. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's that's just a, a thing that I do to sort of keep it easier to keep track of. So it's just like both of the dual rank timings just get set to the same thing. Uh, interestingly enough, like, uh, while normally right to right SCL can normally go lower than read to read SCL, at least on Hynix memory sticks, uh, other memory sticks not necessarily, um, the right to right same dim and different dim can't go as low as the read to read same dim and different dim. Uh, which is kind of interesting. So that, that's why those are at 8, is because they literally w will not work if they're set any lower than that. WRD at 4, and read to write at 16. Um, so pretty standard uh, timings for, for Hynix 16 gigabit 8i. Honestly, if even if you were on a single rank setup, you could actually copy these timings, or they, they should work for you. Because, um, like, the different rank timings are just not going to do anything. Now then, I've disabled TSME. I'm pretty sure this gets dif disabled on auto because it's like some security feature and f unless you're running like a server or something, it just hurts performance. Um, and then what else do we have? Oh yeah, DFE retraining is turned on. Uh, I was experimenting with uh, adjusting some of the resistances on this board and I can't say if these actually help. <laughs> they do work but I'm not sure if they're, like, better than what the board defaults to or not. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily copy these, but if you have a dual rank setup and you're having trouble with it, like, you're trying to replicate my settings, then, like, these are the, the uh, drive strength uh, ODT and, well, actually just drive strength and ODT that I'm using, because I didn't set the uh, other, like, like, I didn't set most of the memory ODTs. Um, actually, I didn't set any of the memory o ODTs. Yeah, I only set the drive strength for the memory, and then, like, ODT on the CPU, drive strength on the CPU, and, uh, command address drive strength on the CPU. So, if you have a dual rank setup and you're trying to run similar settings to what I'm showing here, and it's, like, not working, you could try copying these, um, because they might be necessary, but the thing is I haven't done, like, extensive testing on these, um... And these are just me experimenting because I was trying to get the 2 to 1 mode to suck less. And I think this might be a leftover of that. Um, also because this board trains like, or not trains, this board defaults to some very strange termination values. Like most motherboards that I, for like AM5, will use like 48 ohm ODT. And this board will regularly go all the way down to 26.7. Which is like, I've never seen another motherboard do that. Um, I don't know if it's, like, it, I don't know if that's, like, is necessary or something, but, like, uh, it's weird, and so I was, like, messing around with that to see if, like, does, is that actually a good thing, or, like, and as, 
In one-to-one -one mode, it doesn't really seem to have much of an effect. Um, and in two-to-one mode, uh, well, I don't rem remember what my results were in two, like, wh where I got with two-to-one mode. Well, I do remember two-to-one mode on this board just being really, really bad. So, and that's even in, like, si with single rank dims. Like, dual rank, single rank, it doesn't matter. Um, the two-to-one mode on this board is, is terrible. So, honestly, uh, if you're considering buying this board as, like, a memory overclocking board specifically, I would su suggest you don't do that because it's not good at it. Um, as, like, a daily build for, like, an ITX daily board, I, I don't see any issues with it. But as, like, a bench board, uh, yeah, no, this this is not... Like, the two-to-one mode on this is actually kind of unusable. Um, the Azrock HDB is, like, way better in two-to-one mode than this board is. Actually, even the Asus 4 dimmers are way better than this board is. <laughs> And I don't think very highly of those, <laughs> but this is, this is by far, yeah, out of the AM5 motherboards I've tested, this has the worst two-to-one mode support, um, that I've seen so far, um, by, like, a large margin, like, 7200 seems to basically be the limit, which is, like, for comparison, a lot of the other boards you're doing, like, 7600, 7800, um, Really, really good boards that you can get up to, like, 8,000. Here, it's like, yeah, 7200's kind of a challenge. Um, which is, yeah, that's not good. So, anyway. But in one-to-one -one mode, it's fine. Like, that's the nice thing about one-to-one -one mode is it makes life very easy. Because you're just not running very high memory speeds. So, yeah, that's the timings. Um, pretty standard stuff, except for the TRP TRAS thing, which... I probably going to do a bit more testing. Eh. I might do a little bit more testing on that. I'm mostly wondering if, like, can I do the... Th this is the main thing I'm wondering about, is, like, would that work? Um, Because I'd like that to work. <laughs> if, that, if that would work, that would be cool. Um, but, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, there's more settings. Because, of course, there is. Um, and this is the part where this board actually gets kind of annoying, in my opinion. Um, which is, when you go into the AMD overclocking menu, and then you get to the DDR options, you have the Nitro mode over here. As far as I can tell, you cannot change these. Because I've tried changing them, and after every restart, they are back to 231. So, MSI seems to have these just hard-coded in the BIOS as being 231, and there is nothing you can do about it. Uh, which is just another, like, maybe on a newer BIOS that's been fixed, but on, uh, yeah, this BIOS that I'm using here, which we're on version four, 140, um, you can't change the nitro, uh, our, like, nitro timings here, um, which, uh, sucks. Um, that would be really nice if we could adjust those, because on basically every other motherboard, you can. Uh, I really don't know why MSI has them, like, hard-coded to 231, which, like, these are sensible values as, like, a default to get the system to post, but from a performance perspective, in one-to-one -one mode, you'd, like, ideally want to run something like 1, 2, 0, um, and, like, you can't do that on this board because it won't let you, um, because if you try, like, you punch in 1, 2, 1 or something, and it'll just go right back to 2, 3, 1. Um, or 1, 2, 0, and it'll go back to 2, 3, 1. Like, you, you just can't change them. Um, or at least I can't fit, find a way to change them. Anyway, other than that, I did mess with the controller... Con yeah, memory controller config... Oh, wait, no, that was from the 2 to 1 mode testing. But anyway, here's where the settings are for that. Um, this is what MSI... I think this is what MSI... De yeah, this is what MSI defaults to. And I don't think I changed that for one-to-one -one mode. For two-to-one mode, I was messing around with adjusting those, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. Um, oh, that's cool. So they do actually have a term resistance readout in the files. <laughs> I'm glad that I checked that, because this is, like, because the thing is, like, if you go into the, this menu over here, Um, and technically, like, you can check the, uh, termination settings in Zen timings, but the thing is, this board in 2 to 1 mode is so, t so unstable that getting into Windows in 2 to 1 mode at higher speeds is kind of, um, 
a challenge. Yeah, but the thing is, like, here you can't actually see the the uh, terminate, like, you can't see the resistance uh, settings if you leave them on auto. But if we go back into the AMD overclocking section, you can actually see them, which is kind of cool. Um, I mean, obviously, it would be better if we could see what the auto values are in the actual, like, memory overclocking section, but, you know, um, this works too. It's, like, it could be worse. <laughs> it could be not accessible anywhere in the BIOS. Um, so, yeah. Um, I haven't done anything else to the board um, in terms of settings, and uh, it's kind of that. I guess now let's see if it goes back to Windows and if it, like, immediately errors out in Y-Cruncher. Oh, interesting. MSI actually has the ability to skip straight into Windows out of the out of the BIOS. I like that. Yeah, because a lot of, like, a lot of other motherboards, they, like, they, for AMD, they won't let you just go from the BIOS straight into Windows. So, like, theoretically what you could do is, like, you could go into the BIOS, check your terminations and stuff, and then go into Windows, instead of, like, going straight to Windows. Um, anyway, so I guess we're just gonna go straight for Y-Cruncher. Also, if people are wondering, uh, the Y-Cruncher configuration I use is literally just this. Um, and this is just a batch file that sits in the Y-Cruncher folder, so if we go... Um, open file location, yeah, so here you can see that's just a batch file. Um, anyway, let's open up hardware info. I'm not going to do another extensive uh, stress test, just want to see if it like immediately errors out. Because if it mistrained, it, it would probably do that. Oh, now that I'm running Y-Cruncher, that's reminded me of one other complaint. I have another complaint for this board, other than the fact that the 2 to 1 mode on it is basically useless. Uh, and that is that there's a fan for the chipset. And for whatever reason, MSI tied the RPM of the chipset fan to the CPU temperature. Which is, you know... Um... I'm just going to make things bigger. Which is, uh, you know, um, yeah, not great. Because it goes to like 8,000 RPM. And it's quite loud. <laughs> like, it's not the most annoying thing I've ever heard. But, like, I've heard worse. Reference AMD GPUs, for one thing. Um... But yeah, this is bad. Like, and I'm sure if you go into the BIOS and deal with... I, I'm I'm assuming MSI still hasn't made their fan control less annoying to use. Um, I guess you could also just unplug it. I kind of doubt the chipset actually needs the fan. Though, the thing is, there is an M.2 slot under the heatsink. So I guess that's meant for, like, cooling the M.2 SSD as well. But, uh, yeah, for, like, the, the, either way, the fan, like, that RP, that fan is tied to the CPU temperature, um, which is dumb. It should be tied to, like, chipset temperature or something. Like, I'm pretty sure they even have a chipset temperature sensor. I don't know why this is, like, what? <laughs> like, I even checked if that fan, like, exhausts air onto the VRM heatsink or something, because you, you're, like, it's... It's this fan right here, right? So you'd think like, oh, maybe there's like a vent over here in this area of the board, but there isn't. There's there's nothing in in this area. Um, so it doesn't like cool the VRM or anything. It's literally just for the chipset. And yet it's like tied to the CPU temperature and it goes 8,000 RPM. Um, that's just, that doesn't, you know, that's dumb. Um, and, and, and the board does it on every BIOS. I, I don't remember this being better on the other one. So, yeah, that's just... But, you know, you can fix that. That's, like, a minor I, like a minor issue, unlike the 2-to-1 mode, which uh, I'm not sure can be fixed. 
anyway, um, yeah, that's it. So hopefully this is somewhat helpful. Um, and uh, if you're like setting up dual rank and also just some information about this board, if you were wondering about it, um, it's it's fine, but it's definitely it's definitely not the best a AM5 ITX board. Uh, the thing is, and I kind of knew that going into this, if you check the QVL for this motherboard, it's not exactly confidence inspiring. Um, but, uh, so I wasn't really expecting some amazing one DIM per channel memory overclocker when I was, when I was buying this board. Um, but I did want an ITX AM5 board, and also I haven't had an, like, MSI AM5 board yet, so... I, MSI ITX board, um, because I already have, like, two ASRock boards, so I didn't, I had, yeah, I have two ASRock boards, two Asus boards, uh, a whole bunch of Gigabyte boards, and so when I was choosing, like, I didn't want another ASRock or Asus or Gigabyte board, because I already have so many of those, um, so I went with this thing, and it's not great, um, it's, like, at least it's the cheapest of the ITX boards for B650, um, but it's not that much cheaper than, say, the ASRock option, though I don't know, maybe the ASRock option is just as bad in terms of memory overclocking, I kind of doubt that, <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the worst, but, um, yeah, I haven't really seen any tests for the, the ASRock ITX either, so I don't know how that, that compares. Um, and then there's also, like, an Asus ITX board and the Gigabyte ITX board, I've heard good things about the Gigabyte ITX board for 2 to 1 mode, um, but, uh, yeah, I haven't tested that one myself, so, anyway, that's it for the video, so hopefully you found this somewhat interesting, if not particularly useful, and, uh, that's it, so thanks for watching, like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below, and if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon, there's a link to that down in the description below, there's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch, and I've also got a Bandcamp, there's a link to that down in the description below as well, and that's it for the video, so thanks for watching, and goodbye!